Right, this is a new book called Fox, the Whale and the Wardrobe. All will be revealed when I get around to reading that. Uh, this is my favourite poem from the book. It's called Ball Goes Ever. And time came back with a memory in his mouth, dropped it at my feet. I thought it was going to be something significant and marvellous. But I pick it up and it's this ordinary, insignificant moment. And I think, why? Why that one? And all it is, is I'm playing handball against the whitewashed of the Dixie tree and my uncle's fat. And Sam the Collie is trying to join me. So that's what this is all about. The ball is laughing. It is having a great time being thrown against the wall. Whee! Screams its trajectory. Rabble up, rabble up, rabble up! Hollers the ball. I throw it towards the wall and the wall throws it back at me. Ball and wall and I having a fine old time. Again, again, shout both ball and wall. It is a fine thing for a summer day to contain. Human, ball and wall all enjoying the moment intensely. Memory will warp the reality and morph it into the movie continually replaying as if happiness exists in this little snippet of time and space. Sam the Collie leaps through the air and with perfect timing catches the ball in its mouth. Allah! Ah! screams the ball. Damn! Damn! shouts the wall. Hey! I holler. Hey! But Sam is gone, smiling all over himself. Where he drops the ball, I never get to know. The ball has gone AWOL for well nigh now over 50 years. The wall is no longer standing. Sam is now only a black and white photo. Only I and the moment keep happening in the attic of my head. We met our wills uh, recently, so now that we met our wills, I feel obliged to die. <laughs> and, uh, so the universe kept knocking, and uh, you know, what could I do? So this is called My Molecules Are Revolting. Uh, Walt Whitman said to me the other day, I am large, I contain multitudes. When you die, the universe asks, can I have my molecules back? <laughs> ah, the big bang of death. Sure, thanks for the loan. Wonder what we will be next, one molecule asks another molecule. Who knows? The more articulate molecule answers. That's the beauty of it. The other molecule sniggers. This present formation has not, shall I say, uh, the most interesting. I wait for the molecules to shut up so I can get on with my life. For the moment, they are stuck with me, though they don't care for it. Talking molecules and a demanding universe. That's it. Hi, Coco. Oh, I won't go for that. This is called the map of who we are. When my little one was little, I wasn't writing poetry. So lots of things have just gone past and the past that will be no longer there. And then, every so often, a tiny little moment will come back of Tilly speaking to me. And it's just like it's alive again. So she, like me, uh, she was dyslexic, couldn't read, so she liked atlases. And we read atlases together. And uh, so this is one little tiny moment. It's called The Map of Who We Are. All day long, her head stuck in an atlas. I want to be Argentina when I grow up. <laughs> and after dinner, she changes her mind. Is it okay to be France? <laughs> At bedtime, she is tired of being land. I am going to be the whole Pacific Ocean. Against the fastness of this, my child, I feel like a tiny, tiny island. I fall asleep by this little girl of dreams of and this is for my lovely wife. Uh, it's called, I, I met her, and I was mad about her from the first get-go. She took about uh, eight years to make up her mind. <laughs> but me, I was sure. And I was terrified that I was sure, and I was terrified that she didn't like me. So this is called, shh. Like a tree hiding in a forest, like a leaf hiding on a tree. Like a river hiding in an ocean, like a wave hiding in the sea. I see you see through me, and my carefully camouflaged love. <laughs> <laughs> she knew, she knew. I was once in a lovely Scandinavian library, and it was, everything was wood, everything. Even the backs of books looked like they were wood as well, too. 
And uh, Doctor Who was on the telly regenerating. And uh, so I call this regenerate. The chair I sat in, like a burnished throne, transforming itself back into what once it was. A tree standing in a forest as the world wakes up. A table, too, morphs into its former state. The floor uprooting itself to stand with its fellows. Books shedding their words, becoming leaves on trees. My library, now a forest. I at one with the trees. It was the first time that I had a do that old PE thing where they said, OK, everybody do a tree. This is the title poem, The Fox, The Whale, and The Wardrobe. So, um, my sister, when I was nine, she was only 18, and my sister was killed in a bus crash. And a bus stopped to let people on and off, and a drunk driver came around, smashed into the back of the van, and the paper screamed the next day, bus crash, one, one day. And that was my junior. And I didn't want to be in the world anymore. I couldn't bear it. Couldn't bear myself. Uh, and like Jeremy Hopkins, Jeremy Hopkins, when he was a little fellow, was called Skins. And he used to climb to the top of the highest tree. I also used to climb to the top of the highest tree. But then I drove myself off. But as you can see, I survived. <laughs> I once, I was nine, and I thought, oh, I'm going to be going to secondary soon. So I better find a way. And I, I walked in uh, the school route, and I got lost. And I encountered a train track. So I thought, oh, this is it. I, I can't go on the system. So uh, I put my head on the, on the rail, and it began to sing, like that, and I just waited for a train to come, and uh, somebody went by with a transistor radio going, life's great, life's grand, future, all planned. I thought, oh, Gold Porter, I was even able to recognize Gold Porter that early age, not Gold Porter. And anyway, after half an hour, it began to spill rain, after being a lovely sunny day. And I lay there for another quarter of an hour, getting very wet in the top. Oh, oh. So I got up, walked away, and as I walked away, woo, a train came by. I thought, oh, damn it! And I said, that's why, a word of advice, now I think the word of advice, do not commit suicide by train. <laughs> Don't work, all right? So this is the fox. All oh, the other thing is, my grief made me invisible. So I would sit in a bow window, which we didn't have at home, and I would just stare, and I'd be there for hours, or I'd sit with the milk charts. There's a milk chart, me, and another milk chart. And I became a milk chart. And my uncle would come up and go, Go, oh, no, where is that boy? And he was just here a second ago. <laughs> I thought, uh, <laughs> here I am. My auntie would do the same. Go, oh, no, where are you, Mike? And she'd come into her ward, into the room, and I would have disappeared like that. And she thought, she opened the wardrobe, in the wardrobe, that's where I used to go, and she looked at me, and she couldn't see me. So, grief makes you invisible. So this is the fox, the whale, and the wardrobe. I hide from the world, I hide from your death, hide in my auntie's wardrobe, gather the darkness about me, dissolve into the nothingness I have become. No one knows where I am, no one knows who I am, not even me. My auntie's fox those beady eyes, alive with death. Oh, little boy, you join us in the star. My auntie's whalebone corset smelling evilly of pink plastic. Its white bone escaping, poking me in the ribs, welcomes me to the land of the dead. Whale and fox show me their dreams, the seas and forests of their lives lived in the long ago. My sister's death haunts me all through the ages I have become. Here now in Porto, high above the Douro, I finally write out the sorrow of my life. I am still hiding in the wardrobe in deepest, darkest cork. Or up above in the tallest tree I can find. The land like a map spread out before me. The fox and the whale join me in my darkness, more frightening than they than theirs. The seconds fading into nothingness, the moments rusted into place. Now somewhere in the future I could never have imagined. I, I return to the ruined country to the see the works. The trees piercing the roof's heart, invading the room of where I'd been. 
the old wardrobe still holding the clothes of the dead. Auntie's Sunday best, uncle's smartest suit, rotten now, eaten by time. Our little boy, you've come back, the fox foe whispers in my ear. One eye missing, the corset nothing but a bone. And I cry for the death of summer, I cry for the death of them all. The fox and the whale join them in the darkness they could not have ever envisaged. The little boy could never have imagined the man I have become. I come to comfort the nine-year-old I was, this 67-year-old self, trying to make amends for all the pain he had to endure, crying to a heaven not willing to hear. And his tears, my tears, I gather the darkness about me. Skull, of all the kisses in all the world, and she has to walk smack bang into mine. I kissed you in Islip and Lis, then once again in Swaitland, Shipton and Brashaw. Wherever I kissed you, I only ever wanted to kiss you more. I kissed you in Amberley and Arundel, once I kissed you in Swale and Sway. I kissed you all over in many various places that I cannot remember today. I only remember the kisses scattered all over England, refusing to fade away. This is my little girl again. It's called Coming Back to the World. All right? <laughs> Coming back to the world. She grizzles down the stairs. Each step a song. I fell in asleep, she announces angrily. Oh, that's, that's great, I tell her. It's not good. She chokes back the tears. I missed the world. Well, I smile, trying my best to placate her. When you fell asleep, I say. Yes, she cries. The world fell asleep too. So I didn't miss anything? I comfort her. Not a thing, I assure her. Good, she sniffles. I hate to miss anything the world does. <laughs> <laughs> and this is Tilly again. When she was born, as Jan will equally attest, I sing around the house, but I sing very badly. So when Tilly was born, I used to sing to her from the moment she was born, uh, old jazz standards, everything. So by the time she was a little toddler, she was very familiar with my repertoire. This is uh, called Comes Love, is a very old standard, and Joni Mitchell is a lovely version of it. This is called Comes a Mouse. Comes a headache, you can lose it in a day. Comes a toothache, she the doc dentist right away. Comes love, ah. Oh. Nothing can be done. She wiggles her fingers, she wriggles her toes, tries to mouth the words. She gurgles in her cot, waves her head about, hits her mobile toys. I sing her old jazz standards from the first day of her life. From tiny tot to the toddler of now, she can join in and sing with relish and delight. And the man of daddy, sing me mousy, sing me mousy. Come the measles, you can quarantine a room. Comes a mousy, you can chase her with a broom. Comes love, ah, oh, nothing can be done. Comes love, nothing can be done. <laughs> <laughs> see, I told you I have eyes in the back of my head and I can't see where it landed. <laughs> oh, oh. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, while you're there, have your car as well. Oh, the, my car. Thank you very much. You're pretty good. yourself. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right. Uh, when COVID first hit, uh, I was talking to my friend in India, Sean, and he's a twitcher, and he's mad about birds. He went over from poems to birds. He's more with the birds now. So this was uh, when COVID was just about happening. Um, the Priory Centre was just empty. Shops were empty. Uh, I walked into Guildford, and the sign for a pub it was just like a, a wild west town had gone to waste. And the sign for the pub went... <laughs> it looked like all the world had vanished. So, the tales told by birds. The civilization of the birds will prevail, and they will tell their eggs stories about how the humans nearly destroyed the earth, and how now they only survive in the stories that birds tell to frighten their little hatchlings who don't really believe that such creatures could ever have existed. Buildings left to themselves as if humans had never been invented. 
Nature reclaims its domains, the animals return, a dinosaur takes the moving stairs, a pterodactyl hunts for bargains. <laughs> well, let's see, where, to, where can I go? Ah, uh, this is a, this is called its own good self. No God, just the sweet rain blesses me with its own good self. A robin unaware that he's my prayer. The miracle of sunlight playing with a kitten. Wind sings in a choir of trees, taking all the time in the world. Evening strolls down the lake. And this is called Shortcuts, and it's Tilly again. He's ever present. Shortcuts. I can count to seven, she announces proudly. Wow, I'm amazed that she couldn't count up the tree just the other day. Okay, I say, suck it to me. Seven, she declares. <laughs> oh, and I finished all of the book. Wow, I wow again, seeing as she cannot as yet read a single sentence. Yes, she confirms, I've read all of the full stops. <laughs> this is called I Am Amazons, about my friend who had a very horrible death by cancer. Topless bather, one tanned proud breast, the other white scar. Unashamed of her solitary breast, I am S Amazon, she proclaims. The next year, the other breast is lost. She bears her chest to all, topless, breastless, she smiles at being alive. I offer myself to the sun, sans the emblems of woman. I spit in the cancer's face, dressed now only in bird song, caressed by the sun. Mm -hmm. And I was Ireland's um, first potent residence in a secondary school, uh, which was in Bray. And at one time, Jimmy Joyce lived in Bray, and he was a little young fellow as well. So I was up above the hillside looking down at what Joyce uh, would have looked at when he was with his daddy and having a picnic. Bray Head rises out of the mist. The year 1880 comes back into being. The past, they say, is gone, but goes on forever. It is yet again the beginning of spring, Joyce's birthday. Young Jimmy is always playing somewhere down below. This once his, now my, seaside town. Waves throw themselves over the sea wall as if they would invade both past and present. Spume set flying over the top of houses, water washing into halls. The Joyce children acting out their play, their very own Garden of Eden, Jimmy shining in the role of Satan, with such much energetic, exaggerated wriggling upon his little belly, his snake-like body fashioned from a rolled-up towel. Dante, too, transformed from Mrs. Conway into the Corconian draw-up, the ante. Ring out your great bells and victory, Jimmy yells at a passing rainbow been bitten by an Irish setter on the Esplanade. Mm. Playing football with Bill O'Connell's best hat, the usual uh, jumpers for goalposts. And whatever the, ha the hatter puts it back together with, so that it once more res resumes being a hat, makes it attractive to bees. And be God, but there's a swarm of them dancing about Billy's head on a picnic, probably where I am sitting this very minute. Sure, the bees are only having their tea, Daddy Joyce smirks at you and Jimmy Joyce. And I, Ireland's first poet in residence in the secondary school, see all this happening still, stretched out here on the cold hillside. The past, as they say, never really goes away. It just goes on living in the head of whoever owns the present now. I, the poet in residence to time. A seagull flies by me at eye level, gives me a wink. Ah, uh, how are you? Nice morning, isn't it? <laughs> I'll leave you with this. This is called Don't Forget to Write. You know when you write your poem and you send them out in, into the world and they leave you and people have different ideas of what the poems mean and everything like that? So this is about one of my poems going out into the world. Don't forget to write. Okay then, I'll be, uh, I'll be off, says the poem awkwardly. Thanks for, like, uh, uh, bringing me into being, it shyly says, not really knowing how to say goodbye. Think that of it, I hear myself say in a blasé way. Me at loss for words. Funny that. Sad we have to go our separate ways. Well, my time here is done, the poem almost cries, but doesn't, 
tears in its eyes, tears that can never fall. I kiss it with my voice, the many-headed audience, all ears. Make me proud, I whisper to it as it leaves my mouth. Who was that masked poem? The audience gasped. I blow the poem a kiss, the audience thinks it's for it. Don't forget, the poem throws over its shoulder, now very, very far away to write. Thank you. <laughs>